All right. We are so excited to be back with you again. My name is Wendy Blight. We are in week three of our online study for the book written by our sweet friend, Max Licato. Help is here teaching us all about the Holy Spirit. And Max, I, I'm just, this has just been so much fun. We have two weeks down and I'm so thankful we have two more to go. Well, thank you. It's really a treat to be with you. Um, I, I hope you know how deeply I appreciate the wonderful work that you guys do and the impact that you're having uh, in the lives of so very, very many people. And I'm, I'm honored to be able to be a part of your team every so often. Oh, and we love it. And you know, whenever you have a new book, we are always so, so excited because our women truly love, I think the voice you write with, your sincerity, your humility, and especially your passion and love for God's word. It just pours out on every page. So I hope everyone listening will join this study. And if you can't for sure, get this book because I'm telling you, this is going to hold a treasure place in my heart for a long time. All right. Are you ready for an, another question, Max? I'm ready. I'm all ready. right. So we get these questions all the time and I'm the, the um, biblical content specialist here. So it's my responsibility to answer these kind of questions. So now when I give my answer, I can know it came from an expert named Max Licato and I can share that. So here's the question, Max. We pray for God to move, and we know he moves through his spirit. But how do we know it's the Holy Spirit who's active and moving in our lives, that it's his activity, and maybe not just we did the hard work for it or coincidence or fate? How can we really truly know the Holy Spirit is the one who's moving in our midst? That's another outstanding question. It really is. I think a good starting place for this would be in some of the final words that Jesus gave to his followers uh, before he ascended into heaven. He, he told them, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter one and, and verse eight. That phrase, you shall receive power, power. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not the will of God that we slug wearily through life. Now, fatigue comes with life. We're all probably tired today, but it doesn't need to stay. Mm -hmm. God wants to move us from the need this to the got this. He wants to move us from ever clamoring for something else to being content with what we have and trusting in his strength. And he does so by the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope I'm not going to chase a rabbit here, but I do think it's important to point out that in Scripture, the relationship between the presence of the Spirit and the consequent power of the saint is consistent. This is a theme uh, because the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel. He was able to judge Israel, Judges 3 and verse 10. When Saul received the Spirit, King Saul, he could prophesy, but when the Spirit departed, he was mm -hmm. troubled. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and then later verse 16. There's a story about Bezalel, and he was described as a uniquely skilled craftsman. Why? Because he was filled with the Spirit of God, Exodus 31. And when the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, he was able to stand before the people and proclaim with conviction. That's 2 Chronicles 24. The greatest evidence of the power-giving presence of the Spirit is the life of Jesus. Here's a familiar but important scripture. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Those are the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. So thanks to the anointing of the Spirit, Jesus was able to do all these things. He was able to proclaim. He was able to heal. He was able to release. Now we see why he refused to send out his disciples if they did not have the same strength. That's why he told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
So the unseen presence of the Spirit results in undeniable lives of power. The New Testament repeat, repeatedly links the power within the saint with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just a couple of examples. I'm thinking of uh, the word and. And John the Baptist, according to the prophecy, will be filled with the Holy Spirit and turn many to the Lord. That's in Luke 1. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaimed a blessing on Mary. On Mary. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the gospel with boldness. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and pronounced a rebuke upon a false magician, Acts chapter 13. See that word and? Mm -hmm. so, so many occasions the conjunction and is followed by an action. Sometimes it's followed by a capacity. There's a story of Stephen. He was a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, Acts chapter 6. Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. The disciples are remembered as full of the Holy Spirit and joy, Acts 13, 52. So the point I'm trying to make is simply this. The Holy Spirit has a plan. He has an agenda. He's up to something. And he has the power to help his followers fulfill it. So how, how are we to understand the Holy Spirit? If for somebody who's just uh, beginning to pursue the Holy Spirit, where do we start? Well, I, I think there's two questions. Number one, who is the Spirit? And number two, how do we have a life-giving relationship with the Spirit? Who and how? If we can answer these two questions, we take a giant step toward understanding the third person of the Trinity, who and how. Now, those are not unfamiliar questions. I remember asking those questions when I saw a knock-dead beauty at a church service in 1979. I was at my first ministry post in Miami, Florida. I happened to be standing in front of the congregation when she entered the back door of the sanctuary. I can see her in my memory even oh, now. So the sweet. month was June. The summer sun had already illuminated the sanctuary, and yet she made the room even brighter. I lost my place in my sermon, and I was beginning to lose, lose my heart. Oh. And my question was, who? Who is she? <laughs> and then my second question was, how do I get to know her? Well, I found out who she was. I was a pastor, so I could easily find out who she was. I came to learn her name was Dina Lynn. She could sing like an angel. She was 23. She was a school teacher. She was a Texan. And hallelujah, she was single and unattached. <laughs> so over the next few weeks, I moved from who to how. How can I know more about her? How can I understand her personality? It took some time. But I eventually was told that she had an eye for you-know-who. And so she joined with me in the how. How can we have a relationship? And the answer came in the form of long walks, talks, dates, and a very important conversation at a particular diner, and then a few candlelight dinners and some romantic words. We shared stories. We shared dreams. We held hands. One night we kissed. Within a few months, I found myself standing in a jewelry store on a street called Miracle Mile in Miami. A miracle indeed, for I assumed that Max Marion Dillon was a mile out of my reach. I bought the ring. I gave it and life together began. That was four Aww. decades ago. Now, we've come a long way, but the who and the how continues. I'm not a big fan of making a relationship with the Holy Spirit a secret code or something that somebody can do only because they are super spiritually advanced. I believe a relationship with the Holy Spirit begins with who and continues with how. Who? Who is he? What's on his heart? What are his dreams? What is his desire? And from where did he come? And where does he want to take us? And how? How can we have a relationship with him? Well, in much the same way that a spouse nurtures a marriage relationship, we nurture our relationship with the Spirit. On the wedding day, the bride and groom are each asked, do you take this person as your husband or wife? And the relationship is born out of this intentional 
decision and declaration. I don't know about you, but if I'm overseeing a wedding and somebody says, well, I'm not sure they can't answer the question. They can't say I do. Then I'm going to pull a plug on that particular wedding. Only when they say I do, when they're intentional about it, is the, is, is the relationship going to flourish? Mm -hmm. Then the relationship needs to be nurtured, watered day by day with communication, intimacy, and encouragement. And so this is, this is the simple uh, approach, and I think the most biblical approach to developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Just ask that first question, who is he? And number two, how can I seek to have a relationship mm -hmm. with him? We seek to answer the who and the how. And as we do, here's the good news. We're going to discover power. We're going to discover power. We're going to feel in, in, a, a renewed strength in our hearts, a renewed unity in our relationships. We're going to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and kindness and self-control. We're going to feel power. Mm -hmm. Again, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. One final thought. As we pursue our relationship with the Holy Spirit, let's remember He is pursuing a relationship with us. He longs to have a relationship with you. And there is no uh, exception to this promise. And as we pursue a relationship with the Holy Spirit, let's do so reverently. No one can comprehend His Word. No one. No one can describe Him. If He's the universe, we're just a speck of sand on the beach. If he's the forest, we're just a leaf on a tree. He has depths. He has heights beyond our capacity, beyond our comprehension. So a reverential agnosticism is recommended. There are certain things we will never know just because they haven't been revealed to us. So be on guard for the teacher who speaks of the Spirit flippantly mm -hmm. and has the backstage pass to the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit really good. is... Well, the Spirit is a spirit. Mm -hmm. He's a mystery. Mm -hmm. He does not fit in our box. He will not always submit to our language. He doesn't sit quietly within our parameters. Jesus said he's like the wind. And so the Holy Spirit is holy, holy, mm -hmm. and unlike any being in our world. But isn't that good news? We need alien assistance. We need a source of strength, which is unlike us, which is unbuffeted by what buffets us, undisturbed by what disturbs us, untethered to what ties us down. The Spirit is not subject to weather patterns or aging bodies or mood swings or despot rulers. He has never been sick. He will never be afraid. He does not worry, strive, or struggle. He is holy. So just ask the question, who is he? And how can I have a relationship with him? And you will discover power. Mm. That's beautiful, Max. I want to ask you a question a little bit more about the how. And I was thinking that part of the how may be taking time to be silent and still, and maybe even times of solitude where you are just quiet and in inviting the Holy Spirit to come in and minister to you or open the word in stillness and just read. Do you think those are ways, I'm trying to think of specific ways we might be able to help people with that how? I believe that's absolutely essential. I believe that uh, men and women who are used mightily of God are men and women who are at peace in the silence of God mm -hmm. and can be silent in his presence mm -hmm. and receive him and commune with him. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's very, very important. I think another important facet of a relationship with the Holy Spirit is to receive the unique spiritual gifts that he offers. Oh, yeah. There are many different gifts that he gives. And your mix or your combination of spiritual gifts is different than mine. And it would make sense, wouldn't it, if we want to honor and understand the Holy Spirit, that we pursue a deeper understanding of our own spiritual gifts. What do we do that people love for us to do? And what do we do well? Once we answer those questions, then we're beginning to understand how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that the Holy Spirit does for everyone. 
He secures our salvation. He intercedes in our prayer life. He is the fire that sanctifies us and helps burn off the dross or, or burn out the bad habits. But then there are those things that are unique to a person. And these come in the form of our unique assignments in life. And once he gives an assignment, he gives us the spiritual tools or the Mm -hmm. spiritual gifts with which to fulfill those. And so make it your aim to discover your unique uh, gift mix and serve out of the gifts that the Spirit has given to you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's beautiful. That was a perfect answer to my question. Um, So let me pray for us, and then we'll close. Heavenly Father, um, I really want to just dial in on what Max taught us about just being silent and searching for those gifts, the how of getting to know your spirit that lives inside of us and moves all around us and within us. And so I just pray for specific opportunities, Lord, specific times for people that are listening um, to just sit and be still with you and invite your presence in and your power in and to just open our minds and our hearts to understand our giftedness and to listen to those around us as they as they notice the gifts in us and to pay attention so that your power that the holy spirit's power lord can come in full force and that work through us and just take us out into the world that we could be shining lights of your love and your strength and your power and your hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And we will not leave today without saying what we always love to close with here. When we know the truth and live the truth, it changes everything. See you next week.